Good morning, uh, good afternoon, uh, good evening. Uh, my name is Eric Harrell. I'm the CEO of Keystone Academic Solutions. And um, we have a, a monthly podcast where we uh, interview uh, leaders uh, in the field of higher education. Um, and I'm very pleased today to welcome uh, Karen Panetta, who's the Dean of the Graduate School of Engineering at Tufts University. And I think we have a, I know we have a very exciting and very important topic, which is how to inspire and encourage more women into STEM. So, so welcome, Karen. Thank you, Eric. Um, Happy to be here. No, terrific. No, thanks for, for joining us um, today. And um, I guess um, before we, um, I'm, I'm really excited about talking about uh, STEM and, and encouraging and inspiring more women to STEM. But before we begin, um, it would be great to just get some, you know, for everyone to get some facts and figures and, and about Tufts and the engineering program that, that you run. Sure. So Tufts University is the second oldest university in the United States, and we are located in Medford, Massachusetts, which is 10 minutes from downtown Boston. We have um, a liberal arts college, as well as an engineering school, as well as several professional schools, dental, vet, medical, uh, you know, international uh, law and diplomacy. So we have um, all these together and we're a very tight knit community, very like it, even though we're in a, um, in a city, we've got a really nice, beautiful campus. We also have in engineering, I run seven different programs, you have different departments, the technical departments of electrical, computer engineering, computer science, biomedical engineering, chemical and biological, uh, mechanical as well, civil and environmental is very, is very popular. But we also have engineering management through our Tufts Gordon Institute, which is also one of the unique hallmarks of, of all the programs that I run. And, and how many how many students graduate students do you have in, so, in your program? So we we are a very selective program. So we have approximately eleven 1 hundred graduate students, uh, both masters and PhD. And our master's programs can run from anywhere from nine months to two years, based on you know customizing it for students, what based on what they want to do. Okay. Yeah, and it just uh, again to get a little bit more more grounding for everyone in terms of um, the university, and you know I'm. I'm, uh, you know, I'm a, you know, business person. I'm always looking at sort of differentiation and unique selling points. You know, USP. So it'd be great to hear, you know, how, you know, what differentiates Tufts from other schools. I mean, there are a lot of there are some engineering schools in in your neighborhood in in Boston. Just and, some of the lesser known ones, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe you could talk a little bit about sort of what uh, what are your unique selling points and differentiators. Um, sure. So you know schools. what. Are Sure. So one of the biggest differentiators is access. And, you know, most of our students, whether even if they want to become entrepreneurs, uh, academic, go into academics, regardless of their career, they all want three basic things. One is they want some sort of research experience. So we're a research one institution and we're very interdisciplinary. So I can do projects with the vet school, the dental school, the medical school, you know, very easily. There's very low boundaries, no walls for us to do that. So it doesn't matter what a student's major is. I'm in electrical engineering. I work with the medical school and vet school all the time. So those types of barriers, they, they're, they're nearly non-existent. The second thing our students look for is, you know, when I became dean, I was looking at these programs and I said, I convened um, some of the major CEOs of Cambridge, Massachusetts um, heading firms, large firms and small companies and said, what would differentiate, you know, people you want to hire from every other wonderful, you know, brilliant engineer. And they said, it's the, the professional skills. So that means, you know, negotiation, management, leadership, uh, teamwork, how do, how do you measure that impact? So what I did was I got every single master's program to include uh, courses that would count towards their graduate requirements. So if I'm an electrical engineer, I can take entrepreneurship or professional development types of courses that count towards my degree. So I get that experience rather than expecting the student to, to find it outside of their program. Okay. Um, one thing, one thing that's, that's really helpful. And one thing that is, I'm also very interested in, in, in here, and I think others as well, is maybe just, um, you know, what, 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 um, what is a typical week for you? I mean, what what is it? What does a dean do? I guess as a leader, just curious um, sure. how you spend yeah. your time. Yeah, you know, everybody as a, as everybody dean. thinks I'm, everybody thinks you know you do a day in day out you get bored. There's no two days of the are the same. Yeah. The other pillar that I forgot to tell you that our students really want is 
professional development, mean professional yeah. development, but also work experience. So they want, even if they're doing research, they want some industry experience. So my day-to-day -day operation is how do I provide those professional development experiences? How do I bring in those role models for them to say, you know, I'm interested in artificial intelligence. Well, we have artificial intelligence research going on, but how do I integrate, see what job opportunities there are out there and how industry is really using it? Um, maybe I'm interested as an entrepreneur. Can I use it in finance? Are there companies out there using AI in, in finance? And I bring in those role models to talk to them. We get them those that additional, um, you know, that additional information, but I also give them those opportunities. So we have a huge international population. A lot of students come to Tufts because they love our international community from all over the world. And those students particularly want work experience. And sometimes that's a difficult thing to do in, in the US if you're an international student. So I build partnerships with companies and researchers so that the projects are on campus, but they're serving an industrial need or a client. And that's a great way for students to get an inroad into a company because they've already been working on a project relative specific to that company. So those are some of the ways we, we do that. My day to day operation. The biggest thing that I found is not me just instituting programs and me thinking about, oh, I, sh I should do this or this is what they need. I actually engage with them to say, what do you think we need? What, what is it here? You know, what's missing? So I meet a lot with student groups, individuals. Uh, both at master's level PhDs and, and I ask them what's the dream and they usually get you know taken aback by that but I want to know because I can't craft a program if I don't know what their needs are so one of the biggest things that I've been doing is hearing feedback for them so I was the first one on the Tufts campus for instance to institute paid parental leave for uh, PhD research assistance and, and um, teaching assistance which was profound but at the same time, it really made sense because teaching assistants and our graduate students, they are a lifeline to our research. So, you know, I have these great resume, but my resume wouldn't be that great without my students behind me to make all that happen. No, it's interesting. I, I, um, it's great to hear. I, my last guest, my last two guests, it was the president of Hull Business School and the, the president of Harrisburg University. And that was one of the, the key things that they talked about was, was how how uh, closely they worked with the industry with industry and with companies in the area um, to design programs and also provide ultimate jobs for mm -hmm. the the graduate students. So that's um, it's it's great to hear that that's something that you um, are very much focused on as well um, as as dean. Um, now now I think it's uh, one thing that um, we're sort of getting to the the heart of the uh, uh, the topic, which I'm very excited to get into. And I think. It would be great to hear sort of your path, your journey uh, from kind of the start and how you became a dean, um, but also how you got interested in STEM. I think that would be really interesting to, to hear more more about. What what inspired you basically to get sure. into STEM so, and be a dean? So so th th I have to be perfectly honest. It wasn't it wasn't like a you know everybody thinks it's a linear path. You set your destination and you know go a straight path. It hasn't been like that. It's been a zigzag. It's, you know, it, it sometimes it's just, it's, it's just trying different things. So, you, you know, what inspired me to pursue STEM was really, I had no clue what engineers did. I just had a father who knew that um, I had a math and science aptitude from the very start and, and keen interest in how things worked. So, and I also had a very bad, expensive shopping habit. So he told me I had to find a, a well-paying job that I could be financially secure and not dependent on anybody else. So I think that that was number one. He chose my college for me. Um, as a young girl, I wasn't allowed to go live away. So I went to Boston University and, you know, and living on campus that, you know, when you live 15 minutes away, that was crazy. So you, you don't do things like that. So I commuted. And, and that in itself was, uh, was extra challenges. And I think that it was really enriched me in many ways that I understand diversity population and, and low income students, because I, when I got to become a professor, I saw that people uh, tend to grade, look at grades as equal to character. And that was like, you know what, if you're working, I, I worked in Kenmore Square at a convenience store making you know, sandwiches from 11 p.m. to 5 a.m. And then I was in a lab at 8 a.m. Your grades aren't going to be that great. <laughs> you just, you just, you know, you're lucky to just get through and stay awake and stay healthy. And I think that perspective has helped me along the way understand 
different demographics of students and, and the experiences that they bring. And that, that's why I even helped get rid of uh, test scores at Tufts for, for graduate students, because I thought they, they really were a barrier to, to students who couldn't afford to take tests or who couldn't afford the coaches. I went to industry as a computer engineer. That's what I was trained at at Boston University. And I thought computer engineers design computers. So that's what I did. I became a computer architect at uh, Digital Equipment Corporation, which uh, it was really a rewarding experience. But after I had designed one CPU, two CPUs, I was like, there's gotta be more. So I decided that I would um, you know, try something different. And meanwhile, I also recognized that the people, every time I would want a new role, they'd say, well, this person has a master's or this person has a PhD. And my father already said, you can get free education, you know, paid for by your company, you do it. So I got a master's degree um, part-time while I worked full-time and that really made a huge difference. And then the next thing I did was I went on to, um, my father's like, well, can you get a PhD now? You've got all that coursework out of the way. And I did recognize that leadership, when it came to making decisions, they would still say, you know, when there was a woman versus a man, they'd still say, well, even though you have experience and you've run these successful projects, he has a PhD. And, I, and that to me was like, but he has no experience in this area. I've been doing this. I've been, you know, so um, I was like, all right, that's going to be the barrier. Let me get this PhD. So I did go get that PhD. And then I decided that if I could do that, and it would, you know, I would help other women and students, you know, achieve their dreams. So when I got to Tufts, they said, we're hiring you, you know, to be, uh, you better be a good, you're going to be a good teacher and you're going to be a, um, a good role model for women, which was interesting because I had never taught. And, you know, there was that stigma that all women are good teachers and we're all nurturing. Uh, thank goodness I was, <laughs> but I found that's, that's, that's a stereotype. But the second thing was when yeah. I got to Tufts, there were no women. So that's how I began to say, okay, I need to see why there are no women. And then I recognized that some of the projects they were doing were just, you know, I didn't want to teach them. And if I don't want to teach them, why would anybody want to learn them? So that's how I got into doing projects that I thought if people see the impact that they can make on communities, the environment and people, that will attract them. And that was how I began the Nerd Girls program. Hmm. And then, and then, but the, the interest in becoming a Dean, what, 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 uh, what sort of fomented, fostered um, that, that interest in, in you to be, to be a leader, basically? So I, I think it was the, the lack of programming that I saw, or I, I, I saw students, my students, um, you know, have helped me so much along the way. And I've learned just as much from them about different aspects of life and, 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 yeah. and different journeys and, and cultures all around the world. Yeah. I mean, I had never or even owned a passport until I was, you know, a, a professor for 10 years. And to get their perspective was so empowering for me. And yet I saw that they weren't getting the full you know, they weren't being, they weren't, I don't want to say it wasn't a respect thing, but I would say they weren't getting the full empowerment that I thought they should be getting, that unless they had a good advisor that could specifically say, I'll connect you to a company. I will, you know, oh, here, go to this conference. I can pay for you to go to this conference or meet these people. And I didn't think that anybody's, especially at my institution, I didn't think it was fair that the opportunities for one student were op weren't open and available to all. So that's how I sort of normalized and said, all my students should be able to go to conferences if they publish something. It shouldn't just be, well, you can't go because I can't afford it. Congratulations, I'm sorry, you can't publish your paper. So that's how I said, let me try these programs. And I did. So I, I was, um, the previous dean was uh, Linda Abriola, who was a member of the National Academy of Engineering. And she, she took a chance on me. She said, you know, I'm gonna put you in this role. And she, she essentially, you know, there really was no graduate program per se. We had graduate courses mm -hmm. and she let me craft. She gave me a blank piece of paper and let, just, she let me, you know, uh, run with it. And I'm, you know, I've been deemed in, in since the, um, our, our new Dean came in, Dr. Q came in and he's done the same thing. You know, he's like, you, you, you do good things. You keep doing them. And, and um, as, as long as the programs are growing the, and, the, and the students are happy, then we're happy and it's working. So giving them opportunities, professional development, um, listening to them, actually listening to mm -hmm. them and having them have a voice 
made a, a big difference. And I feel as Dean, I get to, you know, do these projects. And even when I see things that, um, that I don't like, I'm tenured, I'm a full professor, uh, you know, so I, I can challenge chairs and I can advocate. I, I'm a mm. huge advocate for students. And I think people aren't used to that. They think, oh, administration, they're, you know, they're, they're, they're just going to look away. I, I argue with my faculty if I have to, if I think that's the right thing to do. And I have, and, and it makes, they come around because they understand, you know, parental leave is important. Professional development does not mean, you know, somebody used a case once they called professional development vocational. And I had explained, no, professional, just because you've never had a, a, what we call a real working job in the industry doesn't mean that it's vocational. And if you want these students to come back, and make Im impact to the university and to the world around them. They need experience. So mm. some of the cases that I've advocated, the role has given me that platform and respect to be able to do that. Whereas if I was just a, a professor, I could do that. But I think that I have a lot more leverage now and a lot more connections with the administration to get these programs into play. And I think that that's really been instrumental. Okay, so it's uh, that's, that's interesting. I, I think, um... Just for all the the dads and I guess also moms listening out uh, out there uh, on the call, it shows how important parents are in in influence, influencing the direction of their children. I mean, you, you you brought up the fact that your dad was was really kind of quite influential um, um, about the direction you took, and I I know that um, you you talk about your shopping habit, and he was trying to make the connection between your shopping habit and a good job. But one thing is I've I've listened to. A number of your you know interviews um, bef before the you know our, our call and also talking to you um, before this in preparation, um, you were you were making this connection between uh, you know passion, you know find passion you know passion passion that your child has for something and the, the example that I remember you mentioning was art like if you're if you're passionate about art then then you can go into animation you can go into robotics. Maybe right. you could talk a little, you could expand on that, that theme sure. so because, you know, just as much as we have deans and people from engineering schools, listen in there, we have parents That's uh, right. listening That's right. as well. So right. if you could talk a little bit about, you know, that connection. Sure. And Eric, you brought up a good point because, you know, my dad, although he inspired me to do this, he wasn't an engineer himself. So that was the first thing. And for a low income underrepresented groups of individuals, parents play a huge influential role. Um, and, and, and that's why, you know, I've been trying to help parents understand how, even if you're not a STEM or expert, how you can incorporate STEM and at least expose your children to it. And that's why I wrote the whole book, Count Girls In, was essentially that whole strategy for parents. It's written really for parents who are not STEM experts. But the first thing, the recipe for nerd girls came about pretty much because the young ladies that Tufts was recruiting were super well-rounded, you know, um, dances and, and the Nutcracker Ballet in New York City, um, tennis champions, sports champions, writers, and usually engineers and writing, that, that doesn't mix, right? So there was all these um, wonderful uh, liberal arts and artistic abilities that they had. And, and I thought that, well, why, doesn't anybody understand that in imagination, innovation, is that, that's really the impetus for creativity. And that's where you can bring to the table is that different perspective. And a lot of people just keep filtering children at very young ages to say, you can be an engineer if you're the best at math and science. And I, that was the first thing I, I wanted to throw out the door is I don't care what your grades are in math and science. I need you to get through them, that's it. And a lot of, you know, a lot of schools are out there saying, oh no, we need really good scores in math and science. I need persistence. I need someone who can accept failure. I need someone who has a, you know, a, a, in their heart that they want to use technology to benefit humanity. And that was the recipe that I started with. So uh, what I did was I connected and a lot of parents will say, how do I get my daughter interested in engineering? And I'll say, what does she like? And they'll start, I'll say, well, she likes math and science. I'll say, no, 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 no. What does she like? What does she do when she's just hanging out? What is it she does? Oh, well, she likes to cook, you know, she likes to sew, she likes to be in the garden, uh, you know, all these different things. And that's when I would say, okay, well, this is how you start connecting them, connect to their passions. Like you mentioned, Eric, you know, um, I love to draw. Well, then did you ever think that you could do computer graphics, video gaming, things like that, or robotics? Uh, I, I had a dancer 
who, you know, what, what, what does dance have to do with, with engineering? Well, the way the human body moves and improving performance, uh, uh, understanding occupational therapy to help disabled people, it's all, it's all linked and there's so many synergies, but we don't really ever see those because nobody ever introduces those to us. So by seeing mm -hmm. these role models who are doing really exciting things and feels that you've never understood or, or you know, you think that are, are, are far out there, they're not, they're here. And when students see like, oh, that's possible, then I can do that. I have a lot of students interested right now in, uh, in, in space exploration, you know, and so they'll say, can you bring us in role models in space exploration? And I brought in, you know, a, 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 the operations director for all this, the shuttle missions who happened to be of Hispanic descent. So, you know, here's seen a Hispanic woman that's leading this. And I also brought in an astronaut, a female astronaut and former director of um, the Houston Space Center. And they're meeting with them and they're talking with them and they're getting experience with them. And that one-on-one -on -one interaction, small group interaction, you know, that's that's something that's so rewarding and impactful. Yeah. One conversation from somebody like that saying, you know, if you have an interest in this, here's a pathway for you to get there and don't give up, do it. I don't care about your grades. That's those few words will really turn a young person's life around. And that's what I found is the most impactful thing that from the recipes that I put together for best practices. No, this is terrific. It's terrific to hear um, your your story and and uh, you know how you're inspiring you know more women to STEM. And I think one thing, one sort of basic question I'd like to just hear more about is um, why is this important? Why is this? I mean, why is this important to you? How how why are you so super engaged? You know what what's what's driving you? What's the internal motivation uh, behind yeah. this? Sure. I mean, it's, a very, it's a super important. Uh, I think for society, but I'm just curious right. what's motivating you to to be so engaged. I, I, I and, and I got I usually call myself an accidental champion of STEM because it's not yeah. something I set out to I want more women in STEM and whatever. I think yeah. my own experiences growing up about what I could do, what I couldn't do, um, what I was told I was capable of. Um, I mean, I, I have been attacked from my Boston accent telling me, you know, that you get you need to get rid of that. You need to change yourself, you need to, you know, straighten your hair. There were so many things that now I see other populations of underrepresented individuals also have to experience. Plus now I'm named Karen, which is a bad thing, you know, with the media, to, you know, it has a bad connotation to it. So I've got, I, but all the way growing up, I kept hearing what I could and couldn't do, my limitations. And, and you know, there's two types of people. One is the ones who listen and say, okay, I can't do it, therefore I won't even try. And then there's people like me, because my father would always say, you fight, you fight, you, you know, I, I, would, I would look at it and say, well, where is this advice coming from? Is it coming from somebody who really knows who I am and what I wanna do or, or cares about my future? Or is it somebody who's just, you know, shooting off and doesn't know me from anything? And usually it's, it's the latter. And I have found that with my own nerd girls, they'll go out, they'll want to be engineers, they'll want to go to graduate school, and then they'll go do an internship. They'll come back and they'll say, oh, you know, they told me I should go into marketing. And I said, well, where did that come from? Well, I was in with a PhD student from this Ivy League institution. And he said, because I have a good personality, I'm, I'm, I really shouldn't be in engineering. And I have to turn around and say, and how long does this person know you? And what are their credentials? And do they care about your future? And when you look at that, you know, I've, my, my mantra has been, if somebody, you want to be around people who empower you, and if they're not empowering you, get them out of your way. It's okay to get constructive criticism, but from people who don't know you and don't give you really, you know, okay, this this didn't work, here's a, a way around it, but to just make a blanket assumption that, oh, you're a woman, you you know, you come from this uh, underrepresented group, you're, you know, you're, we don't want to. One of the biggest prejudices that I see now at institutions is we talk about diversity, meaning black, white, ethnicity, religion, things like that, sexual orientation. But there's another prejudice that exists and that's the institutional pre prejudice of, we only wanna recruit students from the top five schools. You know, um, most underrepresented and low income people start at community colleges. And we have some really good community colleges in this country. And, and that breaks my heart because they're going there because they can't afford to go to those um, high end priced schools. And when you're only recruiting from the five, same five or six institutions, you're not getting that perspective. You're not getting that diversity. And the example I always give about, you know, you, why do we need 
diversity? Why do we need more women? We bring such unique perspectives based on where we come from and what we've experienced. And one of the examples I always give is, you know, I didn't, the, the classic egg drop ex, um, experiment in high school. And everybody was coming up with propellers and things like that. And my, my design was cheap. I came up with using pantyhose and a rubber band and a cardboard box. And mine worked, it was cheap, it was, you know, it worked. But I always make the analogy, you know, how, how many guys would have come up with using pantyhose in their design? They probably wouldn't have. So that's a perspective, but because I used it every day, I would see that. And I think that that's really what we want. We didn't have safety in vehicles until female engineers went into automotive design. And the average crash dummy was like 5'10 and weighed 165 pounds, which is not indicative of the average woman. So, and, and most of the people that buy minivans are mothers and women. So it was almost like you were ignoring half the population. And from a marketing perspective, that made no sense. Same thing for toys. You know, I have a little boy. The toys are very mechanical, very mathematical. For girls, it was nothing. So finally, you know, when when toys came out that actually looked at designing and building for girls, it, it was it was like, oh my God, what a novel idea. It was like, oh my gosh, you know, we're in the 21st century and we, you finally figure out that half your population and your marketing is to girls and you've totally missed it. So that's another reason why we need these perspectives is to include everybody in the population and bring to the table everybody's voice. And that's the only way we're gonna solve these world challenges. No, I couldn't, couldn't agree more. By the way, I like the Boston, the Boston accent. My, my grandmother was from Boston and, and went to BU uh, undergrad. So um, <laughs> I remember she, she had a very strong Boston accent. Anyway, the, on the nerd girls, I mean, maybe you've mentioned the nerd girls a couple of times. Maybe you could talk a little bit about um, the nerd girls and just for everyone's benefit and what the amp impact has been um, from this program, these programs and, and interviews, I've listened to a couple of them. Sure. So the nerd girls program was something that, like I said, when I got to Tufts and they said, be a role model for women, there were no women. I started recruiting women students and, um, I decided, I said, you know what, I want to show you that even though I'm a computer engineer, we can really use our technical skills to solve any challenge we want because we're interdisciplinary. I had computer engineers, electrical engineers, mechanical engineers, biology majors. I said, let's, let's, let's take a problem. And one of the problems that I did was I, I said, you know, let's, let's learn about solar energy. So we built a solar car and, and I used it as outreach. Cause one of the things that always bothered me about outreach programs is they get young ladies in them to use engineering as a means to outreach to younger generations, which is wonderful. But that was only reinforcing that women are good teachers or women can be teachers. And I, I, I have the greatest respect for teachers, but I wanted more for my girls. I wanted them to be able to say, well, yeah, I can teach and I can communicate, but I can also design. So that was one of the things that I did was I would have these young ladies not only build and go out and teach young children about it, but then I'd put them in front of CEOs of companies and I'd say, present on your design, talk about your design, feel the questions. And people would say, did you prep them? And I was like, no, no, this is, you know, this is just practice. And you could hear the difference. And they were getting job after after job after. And they were getting, um, and right into this day, Nerd Girls has been running over 27 years, 99% of every young woman or underrepresented individual that's gone through the program within three years of graduating from Tufts has gone to graduate programs. So that's, that, that beats the pants off of national averages in the US. And in the programs themselves, you know, when we did the solar energy, they said, well, great, we built a solar car. What are we gonna use this for now? And then all of a sudden it came about that there was a national historic landmark in the United States called the last operating twin lighthouse that used to be powered by whale oil. And then they ran a six mile cable to power the lighthouses to keep its historic status. So they were gonna give it up because they couldn't afford to maintain the cable anymore. So I came in with my team and they trusted us. You know, we worked with the, 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 um, the, the conservation and the, the associations, the nonprofits. And we came in uh, and we looked at this and we said, okay, let's, let's look at all the energy opportunities here on this island. It had the best wind maps off the coast of Massachusetts. It had potential for wave power. And we looked at it and said, let's try LED technology. And they said, oh, we don't want, you know, any newfangled technology. So we came up with a LED powered light beacon 
which could be seen for six nautical miles. And it was powered by a lawnmower battery and a small solar panel. And it was so successful that that design is now used in every United States Coast Guard operated lighthouse. And I always mm -hmm. say, you know, that was designed by a bunch of 19, 20 year old college girls, which was great. We then got a lot of attention. Um, I got attacked a lot on the name Nerd Girls. I got attacked on the name. Like I was, you know, it was, it was derogatory. And if you would look back 10 years ago, Eric, at the definition in the Webster Dictionary, it would say nerd with somebody intelligent, um, or it said stupid and socially inept. If you look at it today, it says smart, but sometimes the socially inept was still in there. I wanted mm -hmm. to, to take ownership and, and change the paradigm. So we did that. So now nobody thinks of nerds as stupid. Nope, right, we're all brilliant. But now we have to work on, and I also wanted to show that we're well-rounded and that well-roundedness really mattered. So the Nerd Girls program is, it's all over the world, you know, and, and, and even K through 12, sometimes they'll start Nerd Girl clubs. Uh, it, it's just been a phenomenon that I didn't expect. And although I got attacked on the name when we went on, um, on the Today Show, we were featured on the Today Show in New York City and people have said, you cast all these, they're not serious engineers, you cast them, they're too pretty, they're too, you know, well-spoken. And, and that to me showed that we really needed more of this because if people think that you need to look and act a certain way, there's still that stigma out there. So I have work to do. So um, mm -hmm. that, that's how it started. And then um, people stopped beating me up over the name when President Obama gave me the nation's highest award for, for engineering mentoring. <laughs> okay, well, congratulations, that's great. <laughs> Um, yeah, so I mean, I guess the this, this summary and um, I mean, it's, it's an amazing program is, is, of course, what you're doing is, is demonstrating, showing role models, you know, that, that women have role models and, and you're displaying that through the Nerd, Nerd Girl program, Nerd Girls program. And in addition, of course, you talked about the importance of parents. Parents can have a significant influence over the direction their, their kids can take and giving them the confidence and giving them the encouragement. But you also talk about the fact of, of really helping parents with your book, you know, count girls in, mm -hmm. um, uh, making the connection between the passion they have and, and, um, and how that can be connected, you know, into robotics and animation and, and other types of fields in engineering. I think when it comes to like, from my perspective, you know, running Keystone, um, I'm very proud to say we have 50% of our workforce um, is, is comprised of women, which, uh, you know, we're, I think, very proud of. Um, but if you look, which is I think very unusual for a technology company. Um, but when you when you look at the technical side, um, we're we're underrepresented in a in a in a in a big degree on the product and, and engineering side. And the question, you know, for you know for you is really, you know, what can we do, you know, in business? How what can we as business leaders? What kinds of things can we do to encourage more women to to come into companies like like Keystone? and into sure. these types of roles. Sure, so you know, some of the, there's, there's two things I wanna hit upon. Um, one is that women in, in technical roles, they, they like to work together as teams, but one of the biggest complaints that I always hear is that they will work as a team, they will give advice, they'll give ideas, but then they don't get attributed credit for mm -hmm. that idea. So, and, and, and that's what I talk about hearing all the voices in the room, because, uh, you know, even as a dean, I will say, you know, make a suggestion or say, well, we should do this. It'll go around the room and then, oh, that's Eric's idea. And then you're just like, <laughs> that's what I just said. And, 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 and if a woman speaks up and says, well, isn't that what I just said? Oh, not a team player, not a team player. Look, she had to point it out. So it's almost like a no win situation. And what I think that I've learned is that peer reinforcement is really important. So for instance, when I'm in a meeting, um, I, I'll, and, and this has happened, I've been in a meeting and it wasn't intentional. I would hear somebody cut off a woman. She was presenting her idea, they cut her off and, and, blah, 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 and they cut her off. And I would say, excuse me, I'd like to hear the rest of her idea. And, and then he was like, oh, sorry. And she, and the woman was just like shell shocked that somebody spoke up. She's like, wow, that was, thank you. That was impactful. And the same thing when, when a woman pitches an idea and then somebody else takes credit for it in the room is, oh yeah, I like Eric's idea. 
you know, they have to say, well, that's great that now we have consensus because Eric now agrees with what Karen just said and what Karen just proposed. Reemphasizing that credit is, is, is super important. So when women feel disrespected or that my contributions are, are not being rewarded, it's, and it's not just the money too, you know, that's, that's one thing, but just to have that reinforcement from the team. Feedback is essential, you know, that you asked her like, what I changed in my programs. Students, you know, they, they don't know, if I wait till I get the grade, you know, I don't have any feedback. How, how do you expect somebody to, to perform and improve? So there's gotta be constructive feedback along the way saying, you know, wow, that was a great presentation. And how about you include some more technical details on this on your next one? Or this part really, you assumed that the audience knew this or something like that. That's constructive feedback. What's not constructive is having somebody go through something and say, oh yeah, thank you for your presentation saying nothing and then their review comes up and it's like you know what you haven't been performing that is the number two complaint that i hear is that women don't get feedback and then the other thing is you've got to have almost published metrics for all your employees and you know one of the biggest things in academia is tenure and promotion and i hear many many times about women in the in the stem disciplines being told well you know your your teaching is not stellar even though your scores are as good as somebody else's, your teaching is not stellar. But because you're a woman, we expect that you're teaching and you're mentoring, because again, there's a stereotype that women are, you know, all, we're all nurturing and, and great mentors. And, and they'll zero in on that. But on the male, you know, you know there's the same, the same score, but somehow it has less weight. So we, we really, you know, looking at those biases is really important. And I usually call it out. I, you know, I'm very vocal when I see this saying, you know, you can't say that, you know, and then you also have to look at the caliber of, of the test. So if somebody is doing a, a really complex test that's never been done before versus something that's been tried and true, how, how do you weight those equally? How do you say, well, you know, of course it's going to take more time for this design or, 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 or different approaches. So I think using metrics, claim what the expectations are, feedback, and also being transparent. One thing I, I really am advocating for companies to do is to be transparent about what it takes to get, you know, pay level to the next level, uh, you know, to get promoted. And so many companies right now will say, well, you know, you, you don't have this degree with this experience, but then you go off and you get that degree and that experience and you still don't get the promotion or they or, or will the manager change or something like that. And that women will just vote with their feet and they'll walk. So those are some you know, tangible things that people can do to change the environment. And then also having, um, you know, having the women tell you what they need. You know, what should mm -hmm. we be doing at our company? What do you see? What's going yeah. on? And having, and having that, that as well. And family is not just about women anymore. Guys are getting involved in family rearing is just as much as women. And whatever we do, you know, we have to think gender equitable. Yeah. No, this is extremely valuable and helpful, like for me in, in my in my role. And I think that to summarize what you're saying, it, it's it's just being conscious about it. It it, it takes you know concrete conscious effort uh, to to address these things, like recognition about you know uh, as you talked about metrics and transparency and things like that. But the 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 summary is really about just being very aware of it and and conscious about this you know the the efforts. When it comes, you know, we've we've talked a little bit about sort of um, a business, but coming to, coming back to, to academics, it would be um, really helpful to um, understand how you've gone about. And this is again interesting, I think, to many of the listeners um, on on this podcast. Um, is is how do you one go about um, uh, inspiring, encouraging women to apply to Tufts and attend Tufts, Tufts, and then number two. You know what are you doing at, at in, in your graduate school of engineering to you know ensure that they uh, that women in your STEM programs have a very really good experience and they and they finish the program. Sure. So I've I've learned two things. One that you know um, getting them into undergraduate is is much easier than getting to go to graduate school, mm. and especially for low income or underrepresented groups and women. I'll put women in that group as well. And we talked about parents having a major influence. So if I successfully get through an undergraduate program in engineering, it's really a hard sell to parents who have been, you know, who've been, you know, uh, um, low income for all their lives 
to now say, well, yeah, go invest another year <laughs> to getting a graduate degree. They want to see the return on investment. They want you to get out there and make money. So even though uh, I started a, a program called Fast Track at Tufts, and it was funded by the National Science Foundation, and I put together a program to help provide scholarships for women and underrepresented and low-income students. And, and I was recruiting from you know, um, students that were already on financial aid. And a lot of them, when the parents would say, I don't want you having any more debt, and I don't want, I want you to just go out and make money, and I don't see what a graduate degree is going to do for you. So that was a hard sell. And so I had to involve the parents in understanding that, you know, yes, you know, they can go out and make money now, but, you know, here's, and I, I give them options. So full time, they, it's a really hard sell. But if I can say, well, you know what, if you go to this company, they'll allow you to get your graduate degree and they'll pay for it. You can do it part time at Tufts and we'll have this flexibility for you. I'm giving them options so that they'll at least experiment with that. The programs, recruiting people and getting women to come to Tufts, you know, I, I talk about, again, it's all projects. It's all the projects and the experiences they'll get, the mm -hmm. impact. I talk about the impact they're going to make, the communities that they're going to be able to work with. Uh, you know, uh, Tufts students, one of their hallmarks is huge, huge community service component to it. Uh, I also am a huge proponent of the professional societies like the IEEE, and as a past president of the IEEE uh, Ada Kappa New Honor Society, that entire student population has a number one component of community service. And so I also see students that want to go out and work in soup kitchens and things like that. And I'm like, well, that's really nice. But you have these valuable, valuable technical skills where you can really use them to benefit these organizations. And that was also a paradigm shift for many people to think that, oh, well, I can set up somebody's website. I can do simple things to help them with their marketing. I can do a data analysis on their, on their deliveries and logistic flow to find out where, you know, streamline processes and save them money. Or I can help them do fundraising better. I can use AI to figure out what, what the demographics are of people who, who have the same interests. Those are the types of skills and the types of projects that students aspire to. And they also like to know that they're gonna have a job when they get out. So one of the number one questions I get when students apply to Tufts is, you know, well, where do your students go? And what kind of job will I, will I get a job? And I have to be honest, the name of the game from all my Tufts graduates, and I can say this honestly, is that it's not, will I get a job? It's which one will I take? And that's a great problem to have, but they're stressed over it. I don't know which one to take because it's, you know, they don't expect that. And I yeah. think that's a huge selling point for our program. Yeah, but, and, and that's great. And, but in, in, and then in terms of once they're there, I mean, I, obviously these are huge selling points and I know this is a huge selling point for them to apply and to enroll and, and to stay. But I think you also, when we spoke before this, you also talked about some very concrete measures you, you took when you became Dean to make it um, more female friendly, more women uh, friendly. Uh, for example, parental leave, and there are some other things that you've done. Maybe you could talk a little bit about those very sort of practical sure. um, sure. measures that you've taken. Sure, so, you know, there's, there's also, you know, again, feedback was really important. So, you know, faculty, I can say on my faculty, students need feedback, but that doesn't mean that they're all gonna act on it. So I put together um, a couple of seminars where I call how to train your advisor. <laughs> mm. where I turn the tables and I'm saying, you know what, you're a student, you're, you, you want feedback. I can go into my advisor and say, I want feedback. How am I doing? What I've taught students to do is given them the skills and competencies to be able to facilitate that, not only that conversation, but be able to make it easy for their faculty members. So, you know, forms, here's the metrics, here's the things, here's what I've done how to document it, you know, how to come up with timelines. You know, we use something called individual development plans. And typically those are only used for, for graduate students. But I think that you, it's, it's sometimes it's like a, a, a agreeing with the contract. One of the biggest things that I see for graduate students and is the, expect, again, expectations. You come into my research group, I'll have a student say, oh, I heard I have to have, you know, five journal papers. And I say, you know, and, and that, that's really, is that true? You, have, you know, I don't know if that's true in my group, that's not true. So I asked them, you know, well, where did you get these expectations? And I think that that's a problem because when they get near graduation and their advisor says, no, you know, you haven't published and say, yes, I do. I have these four papers submitted. And it's like, no, submitted doesn't mean published. And, and then some, so just defining what does published mean? What is, is it, is it published, accepted? Is it actually be out there? 
um, you know, is it a conference paper versus a journal paper? I've helped really zoom in on specific tangible actions so that we can quantify when somebody says, here's what you need to get out, you know, my program, here's what I expect of you, you know, the milestones, you know, after my first year, you should have, you know, presented at a conference, you should have taken these other courses, uh, you should have prepared for your qualifier exams, and here's the areas and the classes. So I, I help structure that conversation. And a lot of students are afraid to ask that. And that's one of the things that at Tufts, I want them to become comfortable with is, you know, not only asking, but being able to get the information they need. And, and some of our, our researchers are world famous in the sense that they might have 50 postdocs under them. So if I'm just a master's student, how am I supposed to get that attention? And at Tufts, we really do try to make sure that our students all feel, regardless of whether they're master's, PhD or postdocs, that everybody is treated with respect and as an individual to craft their own individual plan. That's the biggest other differentiators. No two students have the same. You can't just come with a plain vanilla recipe book. You really need to craft a program that helps explore all the opportunities in different aspects that every student may or may not want. Uh, extremely compelling. Uh, <laughs> I want to go to Tufts now. <laughs> well, it's very um, competitive. And that's why, you know, yeah, students write be... to me. And if they don't get in, you know, again, I'm going to reemphasize, there are thousands of wonderful schools that, you know, just because they're, 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 they're not ranked, like, I'm, I'm fortunate that, you know, Tufts is ranked in the top 50 in the United States. But there's so many wonderful schools out there. And it's really up to the student to make the best of it because there's wonderful faculty at every institution. They're all committed. So don't get stuck on the brand. You know, that's one of the things I've learned during yeah. the pandemic. You know, I don't, I don't wear design of clothes. I, I go whatever I can get access to now. So it's, it's don't be stuck on the brand. Be stuck on who's gonna take care of you. Where are you gonna, you know, um, enrich yourself and where do you think that you can make the most impact? And the rest will come. It's really the honestly, it doesn't matter where you go, the rest will come. Yeah, no, great. I, I love the message. Great message. Um, to shift gears a little bit, um, it's sort of related, but um, where do you see when it, just talking a little bit about education, then I'd like to shift into you know some of the the big um, world problems that that engineers can solve, because I think that's an also a really interesting topic. Before we jump to that, I just have one last question about ac academia. What do you see as the big innovations in in sort of engineering education of the next year, 10 years? How will how will education be different? How will an engineering student be? I mean, how will the education of an engineering student, a graduate student in, you know, 2031 be different than 2021? I, I think we're going to have, we'll see a, a whole philo philosophical paradigm shift of, of ethics and trust because, you know, we've done remote learning. And that whole, we, it's, you know, anybody who thinks that, oh, we're just gonna go back to in-person the way things are, um, that school is gonna be in dire straits if they think that way. The schools that are gonna move ahead and get the, the attention of the students are the ones that offer that flexibility, especially for remote learning. And a part of that requires trust and support. So, you know, we've been mailing out engineering. You know, one of the big things in engineering is like, well, how do I gonna do experiments? Well, you're gonna see a huge advance in, in, in simulators, especially with use of AI. So a lot, there'll be a lot more simulation that, to do experiments. The physical things, I think we'll see a lot more people doing hands-on things at home or with more what I call self-contained types of things. The things that you're doing in biomedical labs with, you know, hazards those are either going to be simulated or, you know, you're really going to have to go somewhere to a facility, but maybe satellite types of opportunities to be able to do that. Right now, Tufts has a satellite campus uh, at Beijing Normal University because so many of my, um, my Asian students could not get visas to come to the United States. They're still getting that same wonderful experience, Tufts experience, but they have their own dorm and, and those types of things. So I think you're going to see a lot more satellite campuses that uh, still build cohorts because that's really important. And that's the uh, theme that I've been seeing that works is to have cohorts. So you don't feel, even if I'm home working on my own thing, I'm still have a cohort that I can work with and talk to. And the other big thing that we're gonna see is so much more automation. 
you know, um, uh, IEEE had done a, a study on robotics and telehealth and things like that before COVID and after COVID. And here in the US, you know, even though we're designing a lot of the technology here, they didn't want robots doing telehealth or checking or, you know, checking our health or doing inspections on our children. And now since COVID, it's like, yeah, we want robots disinfecting everything. We want them, you know, doing automatic, safe um, health care. And I think you're going to see a lot more advances in that way. You're going to see a lot more remote labs. So if I want to do a robotics experiment, and, I, and we already do this at Tufts through our Center of Engineering Education and Outreach, we had that foresight, is, is you can log in. It's a real robot, but you're controlling it. So you get to still do your experiments, even though you're not physically in the lab, you can still have the control of the manual objects that are there. And I think that that's something else we're going to be seeing. So we're going to be able to have robots doing the experiment for us where we're still in control. Interesting. That's exciting. Exciting next 10 years um, for those entering the engineering fields. Um, just to sort of the last ch uh, chunk of questions in the last minutes that we have have with you, um, one one area that I would really um, like to hear more about is is sort of the say top three or four uh, world issues that that um, engineers can help solve and and your graduate students, the people who are graduating from your program are solving today. What are those key three or four areas uh, where graduates of Tufts can have the most impact um, sure. on the world? So, sure, so climate change and the environment, you know, fresh uh, providing clean water and, and, and clean energy is number one. Number two is obviously healthcare. Um, but, being, but, but not healthcare just for the, the people in cities with the best resources, but being able to provide quality, low cost healthcare um, throughout the world to all populations and making it accessible. And then the third one obviously is going to be access to technology and connectivity. So, you know, even though we have 5G and these great technologies, there's, there's people that still just have access via cell phone and can't get into the internet. So those types of, of technology accessibility is also gonna be a world challenge. And I also think that as we move forward with artificial intelligence and machine learning, ethics and AI and, and more of a, what I would say social responsibility is really something that engineers typically, we think about it in terms of safety, but I think that social responsibility and being able to design our, our technologies to ensure that anybody who wants to misuse it, those scenarios that, that you know, security, privacy and security are built in. So that are, I would call it, you know, cyber, cyber policy and security is probably one of the biggest areas. Interesting. And, and um, maybe you could, where, where do some of your graduate students, what are some things, interesting things your graduate students are working on? Uh, so students, not only existing students that are in your program, but also students that have graduated uh, from your program. Just be really cool to hear some examples of, sure. of you know, <laughs> world issues and world problems and world opportunities that they're, that they're focused on. Sure. So, you know, um, some of my, well, some of my nerd girls are professors uh, doing emotion recognition for being able to detect help um, therapy for autistic children, understanding how autistic children learn. They, we have a lot of data scientists out there collecting data on populations. Uh, we're working with nutrition. The Tufts has a school, a Friedman School of Nutrition. We're looking at, at um, healthy aging. For, for elderly to help them stay in their homes longer with in-home care uh, and being able to monitor them via telehealth. We're looking at education, coming up like, you know, huge education, talking about the, the learning and how, peop how people learn, how the best way to teach people is, is another one because again, you know, different populations, different abilities, uh, it, just because you have a different learning ability than me does not mean that the same approach would work. So how do we understand that? Also understanding, um, I mentioned cybersecurity and policy is huge. You know, a lot of people got upset with me when some of my engineers turned into journalists. And I said, well, who better to go out and ask the difficult questions about new technology coming out than someone who understands it? Because you, you see some of these myths come out about technology and what, you know, how many, how dangerous it is. And unless you have skilled individuals that can ask the questions and know, the real facts, disseminating true fact um, to the populations and the broader audiences is, is essential, right? We've seen what happens when, when it's not. So we, we really need people who are skilled to be able to do that. And then finally, I think that um, 
being able to identify huge social problems like human trafficking, I think is, is, a, is, a, is some things that people don't wanna talk about or facial recognition uh, in, 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 in privacy. Those are hot contentious topics but people want to shy away from them. Organizations want to shy away from them. And in order for us to conquer them or to come up with viable solutions, we need to talk about it. We need to face it. And we need to really um, have invested people to bring it up and, and, and not just talk about it. In this generation, they don't want to hear talk. They want action. And I think that that's one of the most promising things that I see coming out of my tough students is they will stand up and they will advocate and they will take action and not just use words or hold signs up about it. Mm. Yeah, this is, uh, it's, it's terrific uh, for me. I mean, I'm learning a lot from this and I, I think um, it, it really goes to show really um, how broad an impact engineers can have on, on world problems, social problems, you know, healthcare problems, things like that. And I think that's, that's obviously a message that, um, I mean, in my mind, needs to get out there in a broader way to society so that we can attract um, more people into engineering and absolutely more women into engineering. Uh, so, I mean, for me, this is just uh, many, many compelling reasons why uh, more women and more men and more people should go into the engineering field because there's some, uh, the world needs more, more people addressing these, um, these issues. Um, one final question in the sort of the final minutes we have with you. Um, what would you what would you want your legacy to be at, at Tufts? That's a tough one. I, I, I think that I just you know wanted to be known as the, the the girl that wasn't supposed to be here that made it and made a difference on the world. Because yeah. by all accounts, you know, I, I, I shouldn't be where I am. I shouldn't have accomplished what I have. And, um, and, and I've, I have essentially, you know, people call me the princess warrior or, you know, I, I a pioneer, a champion. It has been a constant uphill battle. And what I want people, and my legacy is that I hope that in future generations, when people don't have to fight for it, they don't have to bring it up and, and we have solved these problems, you know, they'll say, well, thanks to her, you know, she, she, she took the, the bumps and the, the hits for us. And that's, we're, we're living better today because she did that. And she opened the world's eyes to the way things really are and stood up and, 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 and actually implemented change. Mm. No, that's great. I, I know also one thing you didn't mention, but I know that you've also taken your message uh, globally. Yes. Um, you've, tra you've traveled, you've traveled many parts of the world, many different parts of the world, developing countries, developed countries to, to kind of, you know, get this message, message out there. Um, I think I just, wanted, um, I just wanted to sum it up the way I usually say it is. Yeah, sure. I want to change the way nations think about women's contributions yeah. in, in engineering. Yeah, that's terrific. I, I just want to say, like, I, I, this has been an awesome discussion with you. I, I really uh, appreciate um, your time. It's been really inspiring for me. Um, and I think, um, and you're, you're obviously an amazing spokesperson uh, for, for Tufts University. I mean, mm -hmm. we should, we should any, any person applying to Tufts Graduate School of Engineering should listen to this, uh, this interview. Uh, and I'm sure they would, they would apply and go mm -hmm. <laughs> to Tufts. And, well, and so they I get really, to meet me. I do meet and greets, you know, for any of the deans good. out there, meet and greets with the dean is really important. So, yeah. you know, not just not just your grad admission staff. Your, your, get the deans in there. If you can't get your deans in there, get a new dean. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, well, thank you so much for your time, Karen. Uh, really, mm -hmm. really appreciate it, and really appreciate everyone uh, listening in. And and uh, I'll keep. Uh, we'll we'll have another podcast next month. But this has been awesome uh, meeting with you today and and talking about Tufts and and the, the difference that you're making uh, for not just Tufts but but globally. So thanks so much for everything you're doing. Thank so you. Thanks everyone.